So good morning and welcome to the IIEA's latest public webinar. It is a great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Enrico Letta, who was Prime Minister of Italy in 2013-2014 and previously Minister for EU, EU Affairs and also Minister for Industry and Commerce. He was a member of the Italian Parliament from 2001 to 2004 and again from 2006 to 20, 2015. In, during that, in the middle of that period, from 20, 2004 to 2006, he was a member of the European Parliament. He currently lives in France, where he is the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po. Italy has been one of the countries hit hardest by the coronavirus, and on behalf of the Institute, I would like to express our condolences and solidarity to Enrico during this difficult period for his country, and indeed for all of us. The pandemic has been a great shock, it has led to a significant loss of life across Europe and the rest of the world. It has pushed tens of millions of people into unemployment and it threatens the survival of millions of businesses. It has also generated political strains, not least among the members of the European Union. Dr. Letta will address some of these issues over the next 20 minutes or so. He will then take questions which can be submitted via the Q&A function on Zoom located at the bottom of your screen Feel free to send your questions at any time during the pres presentation. And if possible, if you could keep them shorter rather than longer, it, it makes it easier to moderate the discussion. So uh, thank, uh, thank you, Enrico, again for joining us. And we look forward to your presentation. Over to you. Uh, I thank you very much, first of all. Uh, thanks uh, the Institute and you personally for this invitation. For me, it's a great opportunity and thank you also for your kind and very warm words. Um, I will propose five different uh, uh, points that I would like to raise in this presentation uh, related to uh, uh, the European response and what uh, different countries like mine are experiencing, uh, which is the way in which we are living in this period and what are the potential risks for the European uh, Union. I take uh, for granted uh, maybe uh, the brand uh, that, and the slogan, uh, very sad, that my, one of my mentors, Jacques Delors, decided to uh, uh, tell us some, some weeks ago, saying that uh, the European Union is uh, in a mortal risk in this very period. And I think Jacques Delors, um, his voice is very rare in uh, this very period. Uh, and I think he's right. There's a mortal risk for the European Union, and we have to act to avoid this mortal risk. Uh, so five points. One, first one is the uh, fact that this uh, crisis uh, is creating uh, a big, big, big challenge for uh, the raise of inequalities uh, at the European level and within our societies. Uh, second, there's a second uh, big challenge. Uh, it is for our democracies. Democracy is in danger. Um, human rights, uh, digital human rights are in danger in this very period. Uh, we are under pressure on privacy rights and on democratic rights. And it's a second uh, big topic for me. Third topic is the fact that the European Union is giving uh, two tracks. Responses from the institutions and the cooperation among member states. And there's a big difference. Uh, fourth point is the big divide on the uh, post-coronavirus uh, policies and which kind of response to tackle uh, the economic recession. And there's a big divide within the European Union uh, between two groups of countries. One group of countries thinking that growth policies are only at national level. Uh, and another group of countries thinking that we need European uh, growth policies. And I think the next European Council will be uh, the ground of the battle on these two uh, different uh, um, ideas. 
And my fifth point is about uh, the fact that we have to follow the way in which the political debate at European level uh, is raising in, in the last weeks and is developing itself uh, because there's a true political debate, maybe for the first time after a, a long period. At the same time, this political debate uh, is more influenced by stereotypes, nationalistic or national stereotypes, lazy stereotypes, and the big risk is also related to these stereotypes and this kind of uh, communication. So start by uh, uh, addressing my first point. I think inequalities are there raising uh, because of men are the most, for me, important in our society. This first one is related to education. We are all experiencing what does it mean uh, passing to uh, uh, online courses, online school activities, education activities. We are all thinking, uh, even in my university, on how to start again uh, next fall semester. And it is not for granted that we are able to, to have full classes or physical presence in our universities in September, the same for schools. And my point about education is the fact that when you have someone in difficulty in a, a learning experience, uh, online is the way to uh, leave him alone at the end of the day, uh, not to take care of him and uh, the physical presence is the only way to take care of someone who is in uh, difficulty or risks to be marginalized and uh, the big and the first big inequality uh, today is in the education bill uh, the second one is on social uh, on jobs, on uh, labor market, we had to face a big revolution in the labor market because the digitalization of labor market is uh, bringing a situation in which after the crisis, uh, I think many jobs will be fired because of the acceleration of digitalization and it is something that we can't avoid. But at the same time, the social disease and the social consequences uh, will be a sort of earthquake. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the other point in terms of inequalities, of course, is related to the fact that the virus is the same for everyone, every country, but there are countries with room for reactions because of uh, less debts and countries with less rooms, uh, re less room for reactions uh, because of uh, the past and because of debt of the past. And of course, uh, we need to react uh, all together in a very strong way, not uh, pushing for uh, widening the gap, because the big risk is to have countries with more money today and able to respond and able to uh, relaunch. It is very important to stop any uh, narrative based on the grasshopper and idea. The idea that there are countries that deserved to be attacked by the virus because they were uh, uh, with, with uh, debts and uh, finance not in order and so on and so forth. Virus attacked uh, without any law and uh, this is to be a, a mortal uh, challenge for for Europe in this very period. My second point is about the way in which uh, democracy uh, is under pressure. Uh, there are many subjects. There, of course, there's the Hungarian uh, issue, the fact that in Hungary we had this experience that is until now symbolic, but maybe it will be more than symbolic, uh, of, of how does it mean to uh, uh, closed parliament or to have uh, because of this emergency an approach to democratic values and democratic rules that is not the correct one. I think it was very important that the European Parliament decided to keep open and to work in these very hours while we are here connected in this uh, 
uh, seminar, the European Parliament is discussing, debating, voting uh, remotely. And it's a great lesson of democracy because I know very well that the uh, role, the substantial role of the European Parliament in this crisis will be very important. Having the European Parliament closed will bring the European Union to have different responses, more technocratic maybe responses. Having the European Parliament open will help the European democracy and the European response. So I think this is uh, a great topic. We have to use this emergency to move towards a more uh, maybe a virtual way to apply uh, democratic values, democratic rules. It is very important to do so. It's a great lesson. The other great lesson on uh, uh, democratic challenges is related to privacy. Um, uh, digital human rights, I just mentioned this point. I'm very much worried about the fact that we are not discussing about it. But at the end of the day, the, we are tracking uh, patient, we are tracking uh, people in disease, we are all happy because we are tracking uh, because of the effectiveness of lockdown, but, but frankly speaking, we uh, need to uh, continue to follow our values, personal freedom, uh, digital human rights, and not to transform our society in a, in a I would say, uh, police state, it's not, uh, I think, the way in which we can uh, convert our European values. Uh, um, I mentioned this point because I think it is a, a crucial one. My third point is about uh, the uh, decoupling in the responses by the European institutions. We had uh, very effective responses coming from the European federal institutions. Uh, I, already mentioned the European Parliament, but I would like to pay tribute to the European Central Bank and the European Commission. Frankly speaking, in four weeks, the European Central Bank and the European Commission did more rather than uh, the Commission and the ECB did in four years, from 2008 to, uh, to 2012. During last crisis, they took four years to try to solve the crisis and to invent new tools and to react. Uh, in this crisis, four weeks, and the Commission and the Central Bank were able to be very effective in uh, some important responses. We are today able to discuss, uh, uh, apparently in a, in a quiet situation, on solutions because of the effectiveness of the ECB response, for instance. And I pay tribute, and I think the European institutions, after maybe some mistake beginning, some communication mistakes at the beginning, but every leader uh, in every country uh, had a lot of, com committed a lot of mistakes during the, this crisis. So I think it's acceptable to think that some mistakes were there. But at the end of the day, the European institutions, until now, made a very good job. Um, it is not the case of the European Council until now, and the cooperation among member states is the crucial negative point. Of course, we have next week a very important rendezvous that is the European Council, and the European Council can change uh, the direction and can give, and I hope will give, a very important and positive uh, responses. But until now, the feeling is that the cooperation uh, among member states is not good. Uh, the reactions are not positive. And uh, the way in which they found agreement uh, within the Eurogroup uh, was not the best way. And uh, yes, the agreement was there, but uh, we are very much worried about the evolution of this uh, agreement. So there's a big distinction between uh, European institutions' responses, very effective, and ineffective responses coming from the cooperation uh, among the member states. My fourth point, uh, the other cleavage, is the cleavage uh, that will be, uh, at the end of the day, the mood, and that will be the frame of the European Council meeting next uh, week, is the fact that uh, uh, how to react to the crisis 
there are, of course, we need uh, to uh, tackle the sanitary emergency immediately today. And uh, it is clear that this, this is the main emergency, the main priority. But we know very well that the figures, uh, uh, the recession, the worst recession ever, we need unprecedented tools for an unprecedented crisis. Uh, this is why I think, and this is what I guess, the most important part of the discussion for next European Council will be the famous four pillar uh, of the conclusions of the Eurogroup for the European Council meeting. So the, this famous recovery fund that is mentioned also in a, uh, a large interview uh, today, uh, the FT uh, by Emmanuel Macron, I think this point is the crucial key uh, to understand if the uh, half, em half glass is half uh, full or half empty um, uh, glass at the end of the council. Uh, I think the key will be uh, the perception uh, about the evolution and the development of this fourth pillar. Uh, the other pillars are more traditional tools, the ESM, uh, the investment uh, bank, they are still there, they are traditional tools, uh, like also the, the, the budget, uh, maybe the less traditional tool is this program, sure, uh, by the commission is a positive one, it's a big positive step, uh, but it is not something completely unusual. It was there. It was there in, in, the, in the perception and in the, in the elaboration of the European uh, Commission and the Commissioner uh, Nicola Schmidt was uh, working on this uh, topic since the beginning of his mandate. But what is for me important is this fourth pillar. And on this fourth pillar, this recovery fund that needs creativity because it, we need an unprecedented tool for an unprecedented crisis. There are two different philosophies. One is the idea that, uh, that is the idea, the typical idea coming from uh, Amsterdam or from the Northern countries, this Anseatic League as they framed it, uh, that the European Union is there to assure financial stability. Then growth policies are in the hands of member states. I can't agree. Uh, it is not the right uh, way to address uh, modernity and the real uh, situation of Europe today, because Euro area is very integrated area. It's a very integrated in uh, real economy terms. So we need to have uh, three levels. We need to have the stability, the financial stability assured by the ECB. We need to have national um, initiatives and national policies, but we need also uh, European and Euro area policies for growth because our Euro area is so integrated that we need to have these kind of uh, integrated policies. And uh, a fight between these two different uh, ideas will be, I think, the, the, the big frame uh, of the uh, next European Council. And uh, the final solution will uh, uh, enlighten us to understand what will be the future of the European Union in these terms. My final point is about uh, political debate stereotypes. I think we had in the last months uh, a debate full of stereotypes that changed very much the perception in our countries uh, about uh, the European Union. I was really negatively impressed by uh, seeing some, some polls in my country, Italy, uh, with the change we had in these four weeks. I mentioned four weeks in which the European institutions helped uh, our countries and helped Italy, but the perception was slightly different you have a poll saying that today the true friends of Italy for the majority of the Italians are China, Russia, and the US. And the true enemies 
poor, the majority of the Italians are German in France. And frankly speaking, I think that this perception, the idea that our neighboring countries and European friends are not there to help us, but we have countries like China or Russia that are, are there to help us, is the, is, the, is the perception that is there after one month of crisis. And because also a very uh, stereotype, stereotype uh, based uh, debate, I repeat this grasshopper and narrative was very negative. Uh, this is why I think we have to uh, switch and we have to change completely the narrative, saying that uh, the virus attacked Italy and Spain not because they are countries uh, with uh, large debts. Uh, they attacked Italy and, and Spain. Uh, it was by chance, uh, like New York City today is the biggest city under attack by chance, not because it's uh, southern or uh, an ant uh, city or country. Um, so it is the virus uh, is is there is there in a unprecedented situation, asymmetric situation, and we have to consider that the response has to be symmetric. So we have to consider that all the uh, uh, recession we will uh, experience uh, will be problematic for all of us and we need to have a general response. And this political debate that we are experiencing for the first time, we had in all our national debates, interviews of uh, European leaders, uh, debates with other European leaders coming from other countries, and for the first time, maybe the domestic debates where they're trying to understand the point of view of uh, the other people, the other countries. But these stereotypes and this race of nationalism in the domestic debate was very negative. And I hope uh, the second part of this narrative, yesterday Ursula von der Leyen gave a very good speech in the European uh, Parliament. She was very good. And I hope this speech will uh, start a second time, a new narrative on a, a European response that uh, makes a solidarity in reality, uh, because union means solidarity, and without solidarity, there's no union. Uh, this is uh, uh, my, my take, this is my general guess, and those are my five points, and I'm, I will be more than happy to uh, discuss with all of you. Thank you very much for uh, that uh, very comprehensive and, and clearly structured uh, speech. Uh, as I say, we're open to questions, a lot of questions already coming in, and I might go to our Director General, Michael Collins, who picked up on your very last point um, in relation to President Biden's comments yesterday in the European Parliament, where she said Italy deserved an apology from uh, the rest of the EU. Michael asks, should Italy accept this apology? And he wonders whether or not irreparable damage has been done to the legitimacy of the European Union in Italy. Um, I'm afraid damages are uh, really very, very wide and very deep. Um, polls are showing these damages. Uh, I think now, of course, words are important and what, what Ursula von der Leyen said yesterday was positive and very important. I think there's a last chance. The last chance is uh, next Thursday, next uh, uh, European Council uh, uh, next week. I think the results of this uh, meeting will be decisive because if these results are presented or, you know, communication is very important. If uh, these results will be full of tools, I'm sure. But if they are presented uh, in a positive way, in a good way, with the idea that really there's a common path and common mission, uh, all our countries, European countries, are thinking that it's, it's a problem of a common reaction to the recession, I think we can cope uh, with this uh, 
a complicated issue and complicated situation. Otherwise, uh, if uh, next week we start with the narrative uh, of Prime Minister Rutte or uh, uh, Finance Minister Ekstra, uh, the, the, the two Dutch that were so tough against uh, Italy and Spain, uh, with the idea that uh, is laziness that is the the reason of why uh, the virus is in Italy and Spain and not other reasons, I think its uh, uh, damages would be very high. Uh, I have to say that almost everything is in the hands of one person, and this person is Angela Merkel because at the end of the day, uh, she was very. Uh, tough and the previous European Council stopping any idea of Eurobond. Uh, now she has to be very open on the recovery fund because the recovery fund and the effectiveness and the concrete result of the recovery fund are the only potential possible solution. So I hope that Angela Merkel will uh, uh, be at the level of the expectations, at the level of uh, her predecessor, uh, Helmut Kohl, when uh, Helmut Kohl decided to take some dec important decision more as European leader uh, rather than uh, just a German leader. Uh, it's time for European, for, for uh, the, the, the leaders of the European councils, Council to to think to themselves that they are European leaders and not only national leaders. Could I follow up uh, on that point? Do you think in countries such as Germany that the uh, population uh, feels that kind of European response is legitimate? So is it possible for a leader such as Angela Merkel to lead her people to, to do something that is very different from the past? and? Uh, um, and may involve uh, considerable amounts of money. Do you think the legitimacy is there for, for such a decision? I think it is very important that the rest of the European debate can help her uh, to be convincing. And to help her to be convincing, we have to clarify that there's no mutualization of the debt on the table. That is the key point in political terms. If we are all very um, honest and clear on that point, I'm sure that the German people will understand. But it's also for in, in their own interest. I know very well that the German Entrepreneur Association, for instance, they are pushing for European solutions. But they, are, they know very well that there are many important outcomes of the uh, German industry that, that are with German flags, but at the end of the day, they are uh, European. Uh, I, I, I mean, for instance, car, car industry. If you have Mercedes in mind, Mercedes is a, a typical German brand in the world, but uh, one third of, uh, of the part of Mercedes is done in, is made in Italy. And uh, they know very well that uh, they can't uh, allow Italy to uh, to collapse because Mercedes will collapse with Italy, uh, and that is the the way. In, well, this is why I I mentioned my presentation the the fact that the euro area is really integrated, and this is why we need uh, integrated responses. Uh, a question from Antonio Oraldi who asks if. Uh, this crisis could generate uh, changes in the EU that would address its democratic deficit. Uh, I suppose the question presupposes that there is a deficit in the EU. You, you may have a thought about whether there is and whether this crisis could, uh, could change that. Um, uh, May the 9th, was the date supposed to be the starting point of the conference of the future of Europe. Uh, this conference will be postponed, uh, maybe starting in autumn, 
it was, in my view, a very important step for the future of the European Union because there are many things that, that the European Union has to, to rethink, and to reshape. Uh, about democracy and about politics, my point is, um, is related to the fact that we are all in the hands now of 27 national leaders. These national leaders are national leaders that are under a national legitimacy. They will be in the European Council taking decisions, but they will be all legitimated by their own national constituency. I think time is coming to start with a European legitimacy for European leaders. And this is what is missing today, because it is very difficult to find European legitimacy, a European constituency. Uh, a political leader is there to take decisions, but is there also to respond to his constituency. And the 27, they are their own national constituency. It is very complicated to ask each of them to be leader of a European constituency uh, which doesn't exist. This is why my key point is the fact that we have to build up a sort of European legitimacy in the future. That means transnationalists at the European Parliament or a sort of rebuilding of a popular election of the European Commission president or something like that. But we need to reinforce the European legitimacy of, of uh, leaders. Thank you. Um, Peter Gunning, a former <coughs> Irish diplomat, thanks you for your presentation and uh, agrees with you on the risks to democracy. Uh, but he asks the question around digital rights and privacy and wonders if um, digital tools such as tracking could be used uh, as a means of addressing the uh, health uh, dimension of this emergency. Um, yes, uh, this is what is happening in Italy. It is what is happening. Uh, the, the digital devices are used to track and to use information. Uh, we are all aware that there is no alternative because we have to uh, face a, a mortal combat with, with the virus. But at the same time, I think we need to understand that it is an emergency and we need to consider these rules as emergency rules. And uh, uh, we, we need to consider, the, we need walls, we need uh, digital human rights, we need data protection, we need uh, to be very strong uh, with the, with the giants, tech giants, because they, it is clear that they are, this acceleration of digitalization is, is done without guarantees, without guarantees. Uh, who is in charge or who is owner of all data that we are exchanging in digital way in this very period with an acceleration without any precedent in, in our history. So. My point is that we need to have in our European uh, institutions, in our national government, we need to have, to have in this very moment, people thinking on how to uh, restore normality. Uh, you know, restore normality means how to restore rules and values, um, uh, digital human rights uh, for the normal period after the virus and not to translate or not to uh, move uh, the emergency rules in a sort of uh, inertia uh, way uh, through the to, through the this period to the uh, normal period because i frankly speaking i'm afraid of what is happening because we are all aware of what is necessary today but we are allowing a limitation of freedom and liberties uh, that is unprecedented in our lives, and we have to be aware of that. 
Colm Lauder of a financial services company, Goodbody, here, r raises that very question. And he, he gives examples of the use of decrees in Italy, uh, the limiting of purchases of goods in France from Amazon. And he asks, is there a double standard in the EU treating Hungary in one way uh, when there are possible uh, the political rights violations happening in other countries? So he asks, is there a double standard? Uh, I, I don't think there's a double standard because of uh, a very simple reason. Uh, the Council of Europe, that is not, as you know, a European institution, the Council of Europe, that is the uh, international organization based in Strasbourg uh, and for the respect of human rights and uh, principles, uh, rule of law, uh, is and was uh, accusing Hungary for one precise reason, and the precise reason was the lack of a deadline for the emergency powers that the uh, parliament gave to the government. And that is the key point. Uh, that is not the case for the rest uh, of Europe. We have emergency situations, but within uh, rule of law and within uh, deadlines, clear deadlines, that was not the case in Hungary. So I think the key point for Hungary is this deadline, the lack of deadline, and it's very, I think it's correct to point out the fact that you can't uh, create an emergency situation, emergency powers without, in our uh, rule of law, having a clear deadline and having the parliament in charge for this deadline. This is the key point. Question from Bill Emmett, who's a, uh, an author and journalist, uh, including uh, writes regularly in the Italian papers. Um, his question is, what do you expect to be the future of the current Italian government over the next few months and year, given that the largest parliamentary component, Five Star, is opposing a fundamental Conte policy, namely access to the ESM credit line? That's a very good question. And uh, Bill Lemot is someone who knows very well the Italian uh, uh, political debate. And I think it is another reason to consider next European Council as a crucial moment for uh, European uh, history, because the way in which they will uh, organize the response, the way in which they will uh, organize the recovery fund, the way in which they will clarify uh, the no conditions for the use of the ESM money, resources for uh, sanitary reasons, uh, will uh, uh, influence very much the political debate in Italy, exactly because of the reasons that uh, Bill uh, Emmott raised. And uh, I think the uh, response to his question, the, the answer will be also, uh, it depends on the way in which uh, this European response will come, the way in which Conte will manage, will manage it in the relationship with the rest of uh, uh, the leaders. Uh, until now, I think Italy is standing because of the right choice uh, to create this alliance. And the alliance uh, among uh, France, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Ireland, Portugal, Luxembourg, Slovenia. Uh, it was a very good choice. It was a very good choice. And I think uh, the final result will depend on the solidity of this alliance. And the solidity of this alliance means that France needs to stay there. Have, has to stay there and not to leave this alliance to, uh, uh, to uh, join Germany. Uh, France needs to negotiate with Germany to find a solution, but representing the, the entire group of countries signing with her this document. And on the other hand, Italy has to stay there, not to isolate. Uh, itself because it is it would be a disaster. Uh, my my point is that the isolation of the country in this very period is the, the the mortal risk for Italy. If we stay there in this alliance, trying to have 
the solutions that we can have and because the, the four pillar are all very important and if the fourth one is not an empty box i think the solution is there and it is an, a european solution and uh, and so that can help also five stars for the future to develop their uh, more pro-european approach and to uh, strengthen the relationship with the partito democratico of course italian politics is unpredictable by definition if i may say and this crisis is unpredictable so it is very difficult for me to say what will happen in one month or two months time but frankly speaking i don't see a crisis of government or a change in the italian government in the next months okay uh, elaine davis has a question about euro skepticism in italy and whether it has deeper historical roots uh, where you see it evolving she raises parallels between uh, anti-EU feeling or Euroscepticism in the United Kingdom. Uh, would you care to draw any parallels between <clears throat> how Italians have become more Eurosceptic and uh, the trend in the United Kingdom? Um, I think there's a parallel. I do share uh, the fact that there's a parallel there's a parallel related to grassroots and reasons. There's also in Italy this division between uh, um, a sort of uh, big cities, pro-European approach and rural areas, anti-European approach is typical. Uh, this approach is typical of uh, Italy. And, and it was, of course, typical also of the uh, UK uh, debate and the Brexit debate. There's another reason, uh, and the other reason is the fact that Brexit influenced very much the Italian uh, debate and the Italian relationship, because Brexit happened, and uh, the fact that it happened was a an help and a push, a boost for the anti-European uh, uh, populist leaders for, in Italy, because it was considered as uh, before the referendum and. Uh, uh, it was considered as something impossible to happen. And it happened. So even this fact that it happened uh, helped uh, the Italian anti-European leaders. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the other key point is related to the, the fact that Italy had two crises, two financial crises plus uh, migration crisis that helped very much the anti-European vote. Because in both crises, Italy was in the first front, first line. And in both crises, Italy was left alone in the previous one because of the timing of the response. In the second one, yes, in the refugee crisis, it's clear that this asymmetric crisis and Italy was left alone. So it was very easy for the anti-European leaders to uh, now to start a narrative, an anti-European Union narrative, saying that is the third time that we have a crisis and we are left alone. So we have to put together all these different aspects and these different aspects are showing that the risk, the Euroscepticism raised risk for Italy is, is very high. This is why we need responses, and we, this is why we need very, very effective responses uh, from the European uh, uh, Union in this uh, very period. And we are really on the edge. And uh, I'm very worried, I say very frankly. But I have to say uh, that is what is worrying me is not only for Italy. I was seeing some debates or following some debates in Spain too what happened in the last months for the first time created in Spain, uh, one of the most pro-European countries ever uh, within the European Union, for the first time a sentiment that was a sentiment of uh, uh, mistrust. Uh, uh, and uh, is the demonstration that this division between North and South, uh, core Europe and marginal countries, uh, and, and the way in which the European Union needs a strong communication narrative uh, reframe and reshape is there. So I think it will be one of the main issues for the future. And 
uh, next week will be decisive. Mm. Uh, a linked question from Frank Francis Jacobs, a member of the Institute, um, about attitudes to globalization, something that was um, quite prominent in President Macron's interview with the Financial Times today. Um, he asks, do you think this will have an impact on how people perceive globalization? Will it uh, make people less favorable to, to globalization? And what will the impact be for politicians uh, like Salvini in your country or Le Pen in France? Will it lead to a, an increase in support for what might be called populist politicians and parties? Very good question. My answer is that um, the immediate response, I would say the got response, is that uh, globalization will be stopped by this crisis. And this is the end of globalization and, and so on and so forth. In reality, I think it is exactly the opposite. This crisis is the first crisis of the global world. It is the first crisis of a totally connected world. We understood suddenly that we depend on, we all depend on each other. And uh, this global interdependence, it is not just a thought for dreamers or for people, or cosmopolitan people, it's the reality. And uh, the last, two big challenges in the last 12 months in our lives, pollution and virus. Uh, they didn't need any passport to uh, pass borders. And borders are totally ineffective for virus and for pollution. Uh, so I think the key point is that we will have uh, a sort of mad split uh, because the populist narrative will uh, have a lot of boost uh, because of this crisis, because they will start with a very national narrative. And this national narrative will, uh, is raising, raising because national pride, uh, the fact that we are all locked down in our countries uh, is, is a way also for, to raise national pride. And at the same time, this national pride has to become a European pride, not a, a nationalistic anti-European pride. I say that because I, I think it's very difficult to, to have leaders with a, a sort of a track record, negative track record in terms of position or statements like the one that Salvini, for instance, had in the last months or Marine Le Pen too. They did all the, potent, all the possible mistakes, all the possible mistakes. Uh, but at the same time, they are there because they're, they work on people's fear and they uh, have the European Union as the target. Uh, so they are taking advantage of a situation in which they made a lot of mistakes. They failed completely. Salvini is a totally, is a, is a complete failure. Uh, Salvini is the leader of Lombardy in political terms. And Lombardy was the main, uh, I would say, responsible for the crisis and the way in which the crisis was mismanaged uh, in Italy. So I think Salvini is unable to, uh, to say that uh, is because of someone else, uh, because of scapegoat. Scapegoat doesn't work in reality. But at the same time, this kind of fear narrative and uh, the topic of uh, the European Union as scapegoat uh, works. So I think that we, we, we need uh, to, to uh, have responses, quick responses, effective responses, and to avoid uh, the recession or the worst recession to avoid the so populism. Populism is always the outcome of recessions. So if we have the deepest recession, we will have the deepest and the worst populism. I'm not, I have no doubt on that. Mm. 
Um, many, many questions. If I, can I take two, uh, because they're both related to next week's uh, European Council meeting. Bobby McDonough, who was Ireland's ambassador to Italy while you were a prime minister, asks about the role of political leadership in Italy in terms of influencing public opinion in relation to the European Union. The second question comes from the Irish Times Europe correspondent, Naomi O'Leary. Um, she asks about uh, the risks of having a discussion at the council about this, um, that if we talk about this, uh, a European response as being absolutely essential, is there a risk that the demands actually cause a crisis in the EU um, because some people are bound to be disappointed by the outcome. So are expectations being built up too much, uh, which will make everyone believe there's a failure uh, at next week's European Council? Uh, thank you for these questions. Uh, to to uh, my friend, the ambassador, I have to say that uh, uh, I think the political debate in Italy and the political space was occupied by wise positions. I uh, mentioned, for instance, the big role and the very important role that Mario Draghi played, uh, his position, uh, his paper on the FT was very important in the Italian political debate. And I think we are all very happy because we have uh, the President of the Republic, Sergio Mattarella, playing always a very important role. role uh, he unified the country and is always uh, linking uh, national efforts to the European efforts. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, uh, the big division, big separation between uh, majority and opposition uh, is today uh, a problem. It's a, it's a problem because there's a, a mortal combat between uh, majority and opposition and it's not, uh, bridges are very few. There's, we were all surprised, positively surprised. I was positively surprised by the position that Silvio Berlusconi uh, took, for instance, uh, three days ago. Uh, he took a position that was a very pro-European position uh, in a completely uh, decoupled way uh, and in a different way uh, with, with Salvini and, and Meloni. So uh, I think uh, Berlusconi's position was a, a positive. Uh, I think it depends also on the way in which uh, the, the media will try also to present what will happen. And I move to the second part of the question related to expectation. I think what is missing until now is the correct management of expectations. That is fundamental in any uh, complex decision and in any decision making process how to manage expectations and how to, at the end of this process, get a result that can join uh, the expectations. It is incredible what the European Union and the European institutions did until now. I repeat, it is more than what they did in four years from eight to 12 during the other crisis. So in four weeks, more than they did in four years. But the perception is not enough positive. Uh, this is why uh, the, the work in terms of communication, but also in terms of relationship uh, uh, among leaders is essential. And, uh, and this is why I think it's very important that uh, Merkel, Rutte, can play a positive role and can, 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 can say to their own public opinion that uh, the, the European response is also positive for the countries. And leadership is important to make public opinion aware of that. It is important in Italy to make aware Italians that we can expect 
uh, a European help, but we had also, and we have also some problems, some domestic problems, because the difficulties in uh, uh, managing the, the debt in last years was also part of the lack of credibility uh, today. Uh, and at the same time, so we, we, we need to manage the expectations also because of our own mistakes. But the same we have to ask to Merkel and to Rutte to say to their own public opinion, to lead their public opinion, explaining that it is impossible for Germany to uh, save Germany without saving the rest of uh, Europe. And the same for the Netherlands. So the interconnections are so important that we need a European response. And I hope they will be able to manage expectations. I, um, I am optimistic on, uh, on the next European Council. I can't see such a disaster uh, because a, uh, a lack of uh, agreement uh, will be a disaster. And uh, they can't allow to have a disaster. And the disaster will, will be terrible in terms of consequences for normal people the day after. Uh, so it's, it's very important, I think, to, uh, to now to be able to manage these expectations and, and to find the right way to, to uh, fulfill this uh, fourth box. I focus my attention to this fourth box, the recovery fund. If they are able to fulfill this fourth box, then I think the result will be uh, the famous uh, uh, half full uh, glass that is needed. Let me conclude with two big questions, but they're short, and hopefully they'll allow you to give short answers as we're almost at 10 o'clock. Um, Gabriele Colatina asks, do you think the crisis will accelerate um, uh, environmental uh, policy response? Um, and Pierre-Emmanuel de Beau, who's the um, Belgian ambassador to Ireland, asks, do you think this crisis will lead to a uh, expansion of social policies at European level. More green policies, more social policies. Uh, my answer is yes for both. Uh, more social policy because of what is happening. Uh, one of the four chapter is for the first time a big social chapter. And this sure chapter is a way to relaunch uh, the idea of a social Europe that was not part of the response last time, and we paid the price of this lack of social response. And that's a very important point. I pay tribute to the uh, European Commissioner Nicolas Schmidt uh, because of his commitment on, this topic, on these topics. And on Green Deal, I think, uh, you know, that there are some thoughts that maybe Green Deal can be the victim uh, what is happening. I don't think so. don't think so because uh, for the recovery fund, for instance, the European leaders and the European uh, uh, commissioners are thinking to this recovery fund, applying as model the uh, uh, Green New Deal. That means that the Green New Deal uh, is a success, is there, is a success in terms of narrative, in terms of tools, and I think the Green New Deal can be the way in which the European uh, Union uh, uh, can, can move towards the future. And, and uh, at the end of the day is exactly uh, the meaning that I was trying to develop uh, minutes ago, saying that pollution and virus are together. And they are part of this world of interdependence and uh, they don't need passport to pass borders and there's no more borders for them. So I think we have to keep this fight. And uh, what, what yesterday Ursula von der Leyen said in the European Parliament was, I think, a very good signal. Before thanking you for your excellent presentation and, and, and fantastic answers, let me just remind uh, those in attendance that we'll be continuing this discussion on Tuesday. Uh, among the participants will be the former Prime Minister of Finland, Alex Stubb, uh, which will be interesting to get a, a Northern European perspective on many of the issues we've discussed. Uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Lecto, we'd like to thank you uh, very much for your time. Uh, 
um, for an excellent presentation and for covering so many, uh, so many issues with such expertise. Uh, thank you very much.